number of units required to fill the affordable housing gap requires us to undertake construction throughout the country at the rate of 200,000 new housing units every year for 10 years. Many people have asked why they should be interested in affordable housing project in rural areas. If you look around, you will witness the signs of our urban future. Land sizes are becoming smaller as the population grows in rural agricultural areas. To protect agriculture and food security from the effects of uncontrolled land fragmentation, urbanization must be planned and must be controlled. And the affordable housing program is therefore a vital component of integrated land use planning and development program that we are implementing throughout the country and in every county. Each unit of housing drives demand for different types of labor, professional services, and materials, bringing laborers, masons, bricklayers, artisans, electricians and carpenters, as well as architects, engineers, and quantity surveyors, lawyers, real estate economists, into the equation. Affordable housing is also a major opportunity for manufacturers, developers, and other industries. In other words, the economic boost from housing pillar of our bottom-up economic transformation agenda is significant and undeniably much needed. As we speak, affordable housing now directly accounts for 164,000 new jobs created over the past one year. Honorable members, today marks a significant milestone in our journey towards providing decent and affordable housing for all. After two years of hard work under the affordable housing program, I am proud to announce, and you have seen it in the newspapers, the launch of the sale of the first 4,888 housing units now in completion across 21 social housing projects. These units comprising studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom homes are tailored to meet the needs of our people, offering 10, 1,041 social housing units, 2,133 affordable housing units, and 1,714 affordable middle-class housing units in 24 counties. I invite every Kenyan above the age of 18 to join this historic journey towards home ownership. Guided by our principle of fairness, one ID, one house. Every eligible Kenyan is encouraged to express interest, visit these developments, view the show houses, and engage with on-site staff who are already too willing to assist. The allocation process will be transparent and equitable, ensuring that every qualified applicant has an equal opportunity to own a home. Honorable members, as part of the government's endeavor to build a nation grounded in intergenerational equity opportunities and empowerment for all Kenyans, we have made significant strides in implementing another key pillar of our manifesto, labor migration. This initiative seeks to harness Kenya's abundant human capital by creating meaningful job opportunities abroad, empowering our citizens and positioning Kenyan talent on the global stage. Since July 2023, we have successfully facilitated employment of 105,367 Kenyans across multiple countries in a wide range of jobs. These opportunities span professional, semi-skilled, skilled, and unskilled sectors, including positions for nurses, teachers, and chefs. The National Employment Authority, the lead agency driving our ambitious initiative to create jobs opportunities for qualified Kenyans locally and internationally, currently has a role of 560,000 job openings worldwide. I have encouraged many members to participate in this space. Our focus extends beyond destinations such as the United Kingdom, 
Canada, Australia, Bahrain, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar. We are also expanding our reach by actively negotiating bilateral labor agreements with new potential markets, including Russia, Poland, and Jordan. These efforts are driven by our commitment to open up new pathways for employment, ensuring that Kenyans are well represented in the global workforce. In the digital economy, we are expanding last mile fiber optic connectivity using the extensive Kenya power transmission lines network to the most remote and underserved areas of Kenya and making significant strides to establish digital and ICT hubs. This has created a foundation for digital transformation, enabling IT economy workers, young digital creators, and entrepreneurs to access a wealth of opportunities locally and globally. By bridging the digital divide, we are empowering our youth to compete on an equal footing in the global marketplace and showcasing Kenya's ingenuity and innovation. I congratulate members of this August House for being part of this grand digital plan. Your support, encouragement, and effort is duly recognized. We have also prioritized the empowerment of individuals within the informal sector by unlocking their potential through targeted investment. This includes accessible loans, capacity building programs, and regulatory reforms designed to ease growth. A notable achievement is the partnership with the banking industry, which I participated in a month ago. This extended an additional 150 billion in loans to micro, small, and medium enterprises, complementing the government's efforts to nurture this vital sector. On financial inclusion, we have made remarkable progress through the Hustler Fund. To date, this innovative initiative has disbursed Kenya shillings 60 billion, benefiting 24.6 million Kenyans and mobilized over 3.3 billion in savings. The fund maintains a repeat customer base of 8.5 million beneficiaries with a repayment rate of 79%. To mark the fund's second anniversary, we have taken a bold step by launching a third product specifically tailored for small and medium enterprises. This new initiative will initially target 2 million beneficiaries who have demonstrated a strong credit history with the fund. By so doing, we aim to create a pathway for these entrepreneurs to transition into the formal banking system thereby deepening financial inclusion and strengthening the SME sector. This milestone underscores our commitment to build a financially inclusive and economically resilient nation. The progress we have made has been possible only because the people of Kenya have been courageous, strong, determined, and patriotic. It has also been enabled by a number of early interventions under our bottom-up economic transformation agenda, and at the same time, created space for us to implement the agenda in full. As we proceed with implementation, we expect to quickly capitalize on the gains we have secured and investment and invest resources in the economy with an emphasis on strategic pillars of our plan. As more projects get off the ground, more people get hired, liquidity levels improve, more money ends up in people's pockets. Honorable members, you know we are a democracy. Democracy is a founding principle and defining value of our nation. Democracy is hard won non-negotiable right and guarantees freedom that we are proud of and must always defend. Our national democratic culture expresses itself energetically through robust discourse, boldly speaking truth to power and holding leadership to account. It is a tradition of fearless expression 
and vigorous public participation. This is who we are, and there is nothing anyone can do about it. We understand, therefore, that protests are always legitimate and permitted by the Constitution. Protests are conducted by citizens who are peaceful and unarmed. Assemblies, demonstrations, and picketing to advance constitutionalism, increase accountability, and defend the rule of law are constitutional imperatives. Conversely, mobilization in pursuit of criminal agenda, chaos and anarchy, are explicitly forbidden because we all have a duty to defend our republic, our constitution, and the rights of all people. The government, in particular, must remain vigilant at all times against modern threats to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of our nation, as well as public order, peace, and security. In this digital era, characterized by transformative innovations, including artificial intelligence, it has never been easier to inform, educate, and entertain the people. At the same time, it has never been easier to misinform, mislead, disinform, incite, and alarm the public. Criminals and subversive elements who infiltrate and hijack peaceful protests are a threat both to legitimate protesters and to the public. Incidences of violent criminality in the name of protests threaten the safety of innocent people, public assets, private property, and the social order. The tension, the tension here is stuck. We have a democracy which we are proud of, must defend, and should deepen by all means. And at the same time, we have citizens whose lives, rights, we must protect, and a nation whose security, stability, and prosperity we must safeguard. The task at hand is complicated if citizens and state agencies dilute the distinction between the lawful and the criminal, the just and the unjust, thereby making it difficult to tell protesters and security officers from bandits, gangsters, and criminals. It is also, it is only by following the law that we are able to achieve our aims and apportion accountability properly. It should not be possible for robbers and looters to escape accountability by claiming that they were taking part in a protest. Likewise, it should not be possible for security officers to wound, maim, or even kill citizens and claim that they were engaging violent criminals. We all have a duty to make the necessary distinction and to do so clearly to protect democratic expression and guarantee public safety and security. I must now confront an issue of widespread concern regarding the relationship between citizens and the security services in the context of immense threat and intense political dynamism. Numerous allegations have been made concerning disappearance of people during protests. A number of these cases have been resolved while others have been uncovered as fake news, undermining efforts to find genuine cases of missing persons. A good number of alleged disappearances have also turned out to be arrests made by police officers. In such cases, the suspects have been duly arraigned in court. I must, however, make it very clear that there is no attempt to justify or excuse illegal arrests. Such would be a serious threat to the life and liberty of citizens. I condemn any excessive or extrajudicial action which puts the life and liberty of any person at risk, including disappearances 
and threats to life. I urge all Kenyans with information about such cases to forward the information to the Directorate of Criminal Investigation and to IPOA, where they suspect members of the police service to be implicated. I am aware, for example, that many of the cases that have been raised are being handled by the Independent Police Oversight Authority, an important step in accountability and justice. Many citizens, as well as various organizations representing and championing women's rights and welfare, have expressed concern about gender-based violence and the increasing cases of killings of female victims by male criminals motivated by primitive expressions of gender-based brutality and impunity. Left unaddressed, these incidents will cause the women of our nation to feel increasingly unsafe, even in their own homes. This is both tragic and unacceptable. It also complicates, in disturbing ways, the struggle by Kenyan women for inclusion, for equality, for dignity, social justice, their rights, their protection, a section of our society that has been marginalized for a long time. I am aware that most of these cases of murder of women by men have been investigated and prosecuted. It is my hope that in due course, those found culpable will face the full force of the law. Members, it is time for each of us, political leaders, public officers, religious leaders, traditional institutions and family members, to do our part in raising boys into morally upright men who will never need, who will never need to affirm their masculinity at the expense of women. But, but instead, contribute to making our society just, safe, equal, and inclusive. I appreciate women leaders who have taken time to engage me and propose solutions to address this issue. I have held discussions with other leaders in government, and I have tasked the Deputy President to reach out and facilitate collaborative, broad-based, and multi-sectoral deliberations and recommend effective and radically transformative and affirmative action within the next six months. This parliament, this parliament will recall that early in my tenure, I engaged the leadership of both houses with recommendations on a working formula to actualize meaningful inclusion of women in national leadership. We must seriously question the drivers and the motives of resistance and reluctance to take the next step in actualizing the two-third gender rule. We must call out those who continue to sabotage this right of women to contribute to the, government of our, to the governance of our nation. Women are not second-class citizens. They deserve equal representation at all levels. Honor, <laughs> honorable members, without a doubt, hon honorable members, without a doubt, every shilling of our national revenue matters and must be used to deliver maximum value to Kenyans. Wastage, corruption, and the abuse of office are grave risks to national transformation and a direct threat to the well-being of the people. I have given my full commitment to serve as a responsible steward of public resources. To begin with, I have championed the automation and digitization of government services and revenue collection to promote transparency, seal loopholes that lead to revenue losses, enhance accountability, and eliminate opportunities for corruption, therefore improving efficiency, transparency, 
and integrity. I am delighted to report to this House on the dramatic improvements we have recorded by automating and digitizing our revenue collection and service delivery through eCitizen. We have so far digitized 20,855 government services, up from 350 in 2022, representing an increase of almost 6,000%, while we have significantly improved revenue collection. Take the case of Kenya Wildlife Service, whose total revenue for the year ending June, 20, June 30th, 2023, was 5.3 billion. But after implementing a digital revenue collection system, the revenue grew to 7.6 billion in the year ending June 30th this year, representing a 43% increase. This initiative alone has firmly put Kedah